Hello and welcome to Low Level JavaScript. Today we're going to be talking about something that is often mistaken by developers as a JavaScript shortcoming. Namely, what exactly do you expect the answer to this simple addition to be? If you said 0.3000000000000004, then you're correct, although it means you've probably been exposed to this numerical weirdness before. Now this is of course strange, right? And aren't computers meant to be good at calculation? How did JavaScript manage to mess this up so badly? And of course, this is not actually JavaScript's fault. There are many languages where this would happen. You might find this happening in Python or in Haskell or in C or C++, Elm, Go, Java, Rust, and many, many others. And the thing is, it's not really even a fault. It's just a consequence of a system that's been designed with certain kinds of trade-offs in mind. That system is the IEEE 754 floating point number specification, which provides a method to standardize the binary encoding of a number that can have a decimal expansion. I mean, just think about it for a second. Computers operate on circuitry that deals with ones and zeros, and they can pretty much only perform really simple operations like addition. And without some kind of system on top of regular old ones and zeros, how could you ever hope to express such concepts as pi? That's actually what the IEEE 754 spec is all about. And in this video, not only are we going to learn how that system works, but we're also going to build one from scratch in software. Now, if you go looking for it, you'll find tons of resources that dive into the spec and use deeply academic language to describe the concepts. And you might be fine with that or you might find it deeply overwhelming. In this video, we're actually gonna skip the academic approach and rather jump in with an intuition-based approach that lets you view the system as the execution of a particular kind of idea, which at its heart is really kind of simple. Encoded floating point numbers is actually a sort of compression algorithm, by which I mean we're compressing the infinite set of numbers from zero to infinity and from zero to minus infinity and all the numbers that come between every single integer we're compressing all of those numbers into the very finite space of a certain number of binary bits. If we have, let's say, 16 bits available to store numbers, that means that we can express, at the very best, 65,536 different numbers. And in reality, we can't even manage all of those numbers. The IEEE 754 spec tries to capture as many of those numbers as possible in this system while keeping things sensible. But no matter how many bits you have, there are always going to be gaps because we simply don't have an infinite amount of space. What you have in the end with this system is a single number format that allows you to express very big things and very tiny things in the sub-integer precision. And that's something we kind of take for granted now, but this is actually no small accomplishment. And hopefully with that in mind, that should already answer the riddle of why 0.1 plus 0.2 equals this strange 0.3 variation there simply isn't a way to express that number when we have this number of bits, which actually for us is close enough in most circumstances that it doesn't actually matter, unless you're calculating money or you're building rockets. Then those things really matter to people. But for most things, it's fine. Let's get real now and talk about the actual mechanics at play. We're going to build a 16-bit floating point number system. This is way, way less than the 64 bits that JavaScript and most other languages use as their standard floating point number. But the principles are going to be exactly the same. No matter how many bits you use, floating point numbers are always split up into three parts. The sign, the exponent, and the mantissa. Now you probably have some idea about what a sign is and what an exponent is, but unless you're a mathematician or you've worked a lot with logarithm tables, you probably haven't even seen the word mantissa before. The sign is talking all about whether the number is gonna be positive or negative, and that only takes up one bit. The exponent is a number that's used in an expression like two to the power of something. And that's gonna be used to indicate the general region of the number line that we're focusing in on. That takes up five bits. And finally, the mantissa is like a magnifying glass and it's gonna let us zoom in on more or less the exact location of the number. And that takes up the remaining 10 bits of our total 16. These three components together fit into a kind of formula where N here is the floating point number that we're actually dealing with. Now, this probably doesn't make anything that much clearer right now, but what I want you to know is that if you squint, you should still be able to see the three distinct parts that we already have looked at, the sine, the exponent, and the mantissa. But I actually promised some intuition and not all these fancy formulas and names. Like I said before, floating point numbers are a compression algorithm, and that's also their trade-off. They trade off how easily you can represent a huge range of numbers with how precisely those numbers can be represented. The real key to understanding these numbers is to realize that there's gonna be a process at play here. And that's the idea of taking a rough idea of where the number is that we want, and then zooming in on the fine location of it. Let's look at the rough area first. This is where the exponent comes in. 
You should already know that computers work with powers of 2. Here in this chart we can see that 2 to the power 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, they double every time. Likewise we can use negative powers and that actually gives us the inverses. In our implementation we have 5 bits available to us to express the exponent and we're going to treat those as a signed integer which means we're going to have all the numbers from minus 16 to 15. And I want you to think about this exponent in a particular way, not as a single number, but as a range. So we can make ranges out of these powers of 2, which says that if we have an exponent like 0, we're going to treat that as the range 0, 1. If we have 2 to the 0, that's going to give us 1. And if we have 2 to the 1, that's going to give us 2. So we have this numerical range 1 and 2. Likewise, if we were to have an exponent of 2, then we would think of our range being 2 and 3, which would give us a numerical range of 4 and 8. This is going to be our tool when we talk about the rough area of the number. We represent the rough area that the number falls into as one of these ranges. Let's take a concrete example now. Let's look at a number like 12.52571. That number falls into the numerical range of 8 and 16. And we already know that that's going to represent the exponent range 3 and 4, which means our exponent is going to be 3. Now what we need to do is to zoom in, and that's when the mantis is going to come in. And the first thing we're going to do in order to do that is to work out exactly where, as a percentage, 12.52571 is in our range of 8 to 16. And we can do that like this. We have our lower bound of the numerical range and our upper bound. And if we substitute those in, then we can work this out as a kind of percentage. We end up with 0.56571375. And we can convince ourselves of that by looking at this on a number line and seeing that it is roughly just over halfway into this range. And so one way we might think about this is we take the lower end of the range, which is 8, and we multiply it by 1 plus and then this percentage that we have, and we actually arrive back at the original number. So we've kind of using that exponent and this fractional part that we've derived as a percentage, we're able to encode that original number. But how do we actually encode this percentage into a binary number? Because now we still have a floating point number. It seems like we're back at square one. Let's think about the mantissa. In our mantissa, we have 10 bits available. That gives us all the numbers between 0 and 1024. We could kind of encode this percentage by working out what 56.571375% of 1024 actually is. If we work that out, we get 579.29088. And if we just round that to the closest integer, we end up with 579, which in binary will happily fit in 10 bits. So here we've managed to encode that roughly 56% into an integer, which we can have inside our 16-bit floating point representation. And notice that this is the step where we actually performed the compression, because the rounding we did means that we lost some of the precision that would have given us exactly 12.52571. If we try to do this in reverse now, and we convert 579 back into a percentage, that actually gives us 0.56542968.75, which is very close to, but not exactly, our original 0.5671375. When we sort of go through the process and we take our exponent and we multiply it by 1 plus that number, we end up with 12.5234375. And again, that's pretty close to what our original number was, but it's not quite there. We have an error of roughly 0.00227. And that's pretty good, even for a 16-bit floating point number. But again, that is probably not the kind of error you want in your banking calculations. Armed with all of this knowledge, we've probably got enough to go in and write a software implementation of that. So let's hop over to the editor and start writing some code. Let's start out here with a little table that just reminds us of the position of the bits and the role that they play with regard to the sign, the exponent, or the mantissa. And then we can write some known constants related to the arrangement of these bits. For instance, we can set exponent bits to 5 because we use 5 bits for that and mantissa bits to 10. Let's write a function called encode first. This function is going to take a floating point number n and encode it into our binary system. So we, we need to create those three components, the sign, the exponent, and the mantissa. The sign is pretty easy. We just need to work out which sign our number is, and we can use math.sign for that. Next, we need to work out the range we're in. Now, before we just sort of look this up in the table that we built, but if we want to do this programmatically, we need to ask the question, what is the closest power of 2 that is less than or exactly our number? And we can answer that question using logarithms. Now, if you're ever dealing with an exponent, a logarithm is always hiding around the corner, and that's because they're sort of two sides of the same coin. Three blue, one brown did an excellent video on this. I'm not even going to try to explain it the way he did, so check that out if you want to know more. But we can find our power of two 
by taking the logarithm of our number divided by the logarithm of 2. That's going to give us exactly the power of 2 we would need to use in order to get back to our number, but we need to take the floor of that in order to bump it down to the lower part of the range. This is now going to be our exponent. Well, almost. Remember that formula that I showed earlier? That has this little clause in it that says the exponent has to be encoded. There are specific reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into them here. All we need to do is add 15 to our number and then make sure that we've definitely got that in 5 bits. So we'll use some masking to do that. Getting the upper part of the range is as easy as adding 1. Now, the edge case here is that if the number is negative, this isn't going to work, of course. However, if we just use the absolute value in our calculations, we can encode whether it's positive or negative a little bit later on using the sign bit. And that will take care of not having to deal with negative exponents right now. So we've got our power ranges. And then we can use the same kind of calculation as we did earlier to get this percentage, making sure we use the absolute value of n again. The actual mantissa can be easily calculated based on this percentage. Now all that's left to do is to put these three parts together into one single number by shifting and oring the different parts into place. And let's try it out. If we encode our 12.52571, we get the integer 19,011. And we can look at the exact bits of those, and that gives us this. This has an implicit zero uh, bit for the sign, and if we split this up into the three parts, we can see that the exponent, that's going to come out as 18. But of course, we need to minus 15 from that, which gives us 3. And finally, we have the mantissa, which if we look at it, is 579, exactly what we came out with earlier. So the whole thing looks like it's working in the encoding stage, but we won't know for sure until we implement the decode function. So let's do that. Decode is also going to take an n, but in this case, that n is going to be our encoded number. The first thing we need to do is to extract the sign, the exponent, and the mantissa, and we'll do a little bit more shifting and masking bit magic to make that happen. The next thing we need to do is to turn that mantissa back into a percentage. That's basically the reverse of what we've already done. We simply need to divide it by 1024. Now we have all the components to implement the formula that we actually saw in the beginning of the video. First of all, we've got the sine, which is just negative 1 to the power of the sine. Notice that this is because sine is always going to be 0 or it's going to be 1, and the only two values that can come out of this expression are 1 and minus 1. It's actually a pretty nifty little uh, trick there. Next, we need to multiply that by 1 plus the mantissa. And finally, the whole thing gets multiplied by 2 to the power of the exponent minus 15. And that's it. Let's see if our decode function can decode our number. And we see we get 12.5234375, which is the value that we expected from earlier. So we're done here, right? Well, close. There are a few things missing here. Now, first of all, the IEEE 754 actually specifies some special values. For example, not a number, infinity, minus infinity, and minus zero. These numbers occur as the result of performing certain kinds of operations on the floating point number, such as division. They typically don't occur by constructing them, although you certainly can do that. Negative zero is one that makes some amount of sense. If you have a sign bit, which is set, but the actual value of the number is zero, then you still have zero, but now it's negative. It doesn't really make sense in reality, but in this system, it's a requirement. If you have the highest possible exponent and all zeros for the mantissa, then the spec considers this number to be an infinite value, and the sign bit says whether that's positive or negative infinity. If you have the highest possible exponent and a non-zero mantissa, then the spec considers this to be not a number. Now, in JavaScript, we only have one not a number value, and in many other languages too, but the spec actually specifies different kinds of not a number which can encode what went wrong in the calculation. Now, we're going to skip over that for now and just encode the basic not a number rules. Now, I said there were a couple of problems here, and another problem that can come up is if when we calculate the exponent for our number, it ends up being zero, this is considered to be something called a denormalized number. Functionally, what that means is that instead of doing one dot mantissa, as we do in the formula, we simply use the mantissa on its own. I don't want to get too bogged down in the mathematical details here, but this is simply a way for us to represent numbers that we can't represent otherwise, and it's quite a clever addition to the system. I'm going to leave a bunch of links down in the description where you can read about all of these different concepts in much more detail. Zeros are pretty straightforward because they only require that everything but perhaps the sign bit is a zero. 
We need to add this condition in our encode as well to ensure that we can actually properly encode the zero or the negative zero for that matter. So if n is zero, then we need to get the sign. This can actually be quite tricky because if you try to just take math.sign of negative zero, it simply gives you negative zero back again instead of minus one. You can get the real sign by dividing one by whichever zero you have and then taking the sign of the result of that since it will be either negative infinity or positive infinity. Now we can turn that into either a one or a zero and shift it into the sign bit place. Infinities can be checked by seeing if the exponent is equal to the highest possible five bit value. Then we need to check the mantissa is not equal to zero, which would be not a number. If it's not zero, then the sign bit is gonna determine whether it's negative infinity or positive infinity. And then we'll just handle the else case where this would be a nan. And finally, if we make it through all of those checks, we need to handle the possibility of a denormalized number. If the exponent is a zero, that means the whole part of the mantissa will actually also be a zero. Otherwise, it will be a one. And although we can't get all of these values through our encode function, we can manually construct a couple of them to check decode. First, the infinities. Not a number. So this has been an explanation, but also an exploration into the implementation of an IEEE 754 floating point number system, but it's not complete without the actual operations that we perform on these numbers. In the next installment, we'll actually implement some of the required operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the square root. So make sure you subscribe to low-level JavaScript if you want to catch that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.